What's good, YouTube? It's Mirror Boy Squiddy back another Squiddy. Today, let's talk about how to beat Manadium after Agop because they got a couple of new toys and the deck is now very, very crazy. It's topping a lot of different tournaments and I think this is the type of deck that you definitely have to account for because if they win the die roll, they can basically play through almost everything. So you definitely have to build your deck in a way that can account for this. You know, going second against Manadium is very, very scary. And then when you go first, their deck has a lot of engine to actually push through a lot of different boards. So you got to make sure you guys are um, having cards in your deck to deal with this. So yeah, without further ado, let's dive in. So I think starting off, we should preface this by talking a little bit about what the deck currently does because it's a lot different than the deck was pre-Agov. Pre-Agov, it was kind of harder for them to make a board. The deck was effectively a two-card combo deck that required multiple pieces to play, but now it's become a one-card engine deck thanks to the new cards in Agov, namely this main offender, aka level 6 Synchro, Manadium Trisukta, which allows you to actually revive a level 2 tuner in your graveyard when she's special summoned. Now, this was kind of the missing piece in the puzzle especially with cards like Real Heart, which allows you to add any Manadium monster upon its summon, including Manadium Meek, which is a free extender that can be special summoned out. So now off of one Real Heart is basically full combo because you can special summon it, go off straight into Manadium Trisukta, revive back that same Meek, and then use both the Synchro Summon for Visa's Amritara. Now one thing to note is that the Synchro Monster is actually a tuner as well. So two tuners can fortunately, or unfortunately, I guess if you're on the receiving end, make a Visa's Amritara because he says you just need one or more tuners plus a light monster, not a non-tuner monster, which is kind of crazy. It's one of the only cards that does this next to XX Saber Gotham's. Now, from there, they're able to obviously add any uh, card from their deck that act uh, that mentions Visa Starfrost, and then link off into the Scareclaw Lightheart and start going full combo, thanks to the clause where Amritar is treated as the Visa Starfrost while on the table. So you guys can kind of understand where this is going. A lot of their cards are now one card starters, especially cards that allow them to normal summon and add a card, which basically all of them do, like Rykard. And then of course, there's a new one called Visa Samsara, who happens to be treated as Visa Starfrost while on the field, or in the graveyard, which is absolutely nuts, because you can just do the same thing and link off into the Scareclaw Lightheart, and they can add the field spell to add the uh, Reichheart, and then from there, at the end of their plays, they can also make a Cross Sheep, which allows them to resurrect a monster from their graveyard when they Fusion Summon, and they can, of course, get the free Fusion Summon in the form of Vicious Astraloud out by banishing a Visa Starfrost and a 1500-2100 defense monster. Now, thanks to the fact that they have the Visa Samsara, it means that they have multiple ways to get Visa Starfrost in the graveyard, so they're always going to have access to it. So this deck basically does a lot of things, which culminates in an end board. Generally speaking, they do go off into the Vistio Despeter plus a Baron de Fleur, and on top of that, they either have an Appaloosa or something like an SP Little Knight just for disruption on your turn. But I've also seen some players actually innovating it by going for the Bistil Despeter plus the Cypherium Lord Omega line, where they also have the Baron de Fleur. So they're out, they're looping out two cards in your hand and ending on double Omni Negates plus any other resources. If they had a godlike gas hand, they might have the SP Little Knight as well, which means that you're basically not winning. So yeah, let's dive into the actual cards that you need to play to beat this deck. And on the top of the list, we have Droll Knockbird. Now, before you guys go ahead and clown on me for actually saying this card was bad at one point during our Squidtastic Adventures, that was only relevant to that format, right? Like, this is a completely new format. We've got new cards coming out, new decks like Manadium, and it turns out that Drone Lockbird happens to be good again. This is the type of card that kind of ebbs and flows out of formats. I find that it's a lot akin to, you know, certain hand traps like Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit. Sometimes it's really, really good, or sometimes it's mid slash bad slash mediocre, and in this case, it happens to be very good against Manadium. Why? Because basically their entire deck is consisting of adding cards. They have a bunch of cards that add. You know, Rim Heart adds, the field spell adds, you have cards like the Scareclaw that add, basically everything adds a card and in order for them to continue comboing off, they have to keep adding cards over and over and over again. So this card does a lot by stopping them in their tracks from adding from the deck. Now that doesn't mean you win the game on the spot, generally good players that play Vanadium are still going to play in a way that uh, they can still build a board, right? Like their first search is going to account for you potentially having Drone Lockbird because that happens to be the deck's biggest weakness at this current moment in time. So they will account for that and that means they can still end on a couple of interruptions usually, at least two interruptions 
plus any potential hand traps or non-engine that they happen to either play in their main deck or side in. So I think Drone Lockward is definitely a card that we should have in the, the side deck right now. You guys have won me over, especially right now, but you do have to pair it with other cards to make sure that you can still push past something like a Baron de Fleur, potentially even Bestial Dispatter. So it's really easy for them to get still Omni Negates and Disruption onto the table through Droll. And they might have sided in hand traps as well. So they might have hand traps waiting for you on top of the board. So you have to count for that. Troll does a lot of the heavy lifting, but it's not going to be enough on its own. So make sure that you do pair it with other cards. Next is Ash Blossom. Now, Ash Blossom is obviously quite good in the context of the format. It's decent against every deck. Against this deck, unfortunately, it's a little bit lower impact because hand traps that trade into this deck are very, very bad unless they actually have a blanket-like effect like Droll because they kind of, like, they, them keeping the body means that they can just snowball. A lot of the Manadium cards snowball into multiple cards off one card. The fact that they get to keep the body means half the time they're going to be able to go to the Link 1, which is easily accessible, into Lightheart, add a Field Spell, add a right card, or add a scare claw cash hero and continue to play so we're always kind of nagging as long as they keep the body but that being said i think against a deck where ash blossom is quite low impact like a combo deck i would generally ash the first thing that they activate that starts their plays because there's a chance that they actually brick on that right whereas if you wait for something like a lot i know a lot of players last format were kind of waiting for the manadium assistant back then it was probably correct because it's a two card deck but now if you're waiting to that point or a specific card after they use your initial search then it might be too late by that point they're still going to be able to play they don't care about ash they've already searched the main card that they wanted to get to so if they go something like main phase activate clarium definitely ash there because if they add a rum heart and they start playing you ash this well they already have the room heart so they can start playing you know like the fact that they get a body on the board means that they're going to be able to summon out the meek and still just start the combo so my opinion is to ash the first thing that starts it but i would definitely use ash for things that start their main plays or allows them to get two or more cards off of one so like a plus two i would stop and any card that allows them to tap into the access to the minadium engine so what does that mean well calarium um rum hearts effect the effect of Lightheart or the other field spells as well that allow them to add cards that go into the Lightheart because if they go to Lightheart they get to add the right card which adds an extender so that's already plus two two bodies right now there are a couple of cards that you might consider not ashing for example Scareclaw Lightheart normal summoned because that just adds an extender allowing them to get one body now they are going to be able to link it off into Lightheart but I'm not sure that we should actually ash here either because of the fact that they've already used the effect of right heart to add right so that means that they're not going to be able to use it again that turn nor will they be able to draw a card instead you might want to hold it here for something that follows up that's higher impact like a calarium or a manadium obsession so just recognizing what line they're going for uh, and then adapting to it right because right heart on itself is probably three bodies we don't really care about that as much as them actually getting into the main manadium combo which puts up the end boards and the baron de fleurs so on and so forth other cards that you might not want to ash is something like a Finner effect because that just adds a scare claw. Uh, maybe even the effect of Rathos, you could argue just not ashing that because that just goes in the Fenrir into the scare claw. But it really depends on the context of the rest of your hand as well. Sometimes you're really desperate and you just have to hope they break. So maybe you have to use the ash here. But generally, I think uh, game one, I probably wouldn't do this. Holy crap, we just spent eight minutes talking about Ash Blossom and Droll. Okay, let's move on. DD Crow. This is a card that's not very good against this deck because it's, again, low impact, but it does have some niche utility. There are cards that we can actually DD Crow. For example, the Cross Sheep target that they're trying to bring back, the uh, monster that they're trying to bring back off of Manadium Trisukta. You could even have an argument to banish something like a Beast of Starfrost just so they don't have the immediate access to go into the Vicious Astraloud. So just being cognizant of what they're trying to do. Of course, there is a immediate one that you could do, which is the Scareclaw Arrival target. If you're main deck in Dedicro, these are just things you can hit. But post side, I'm not sure Dedicro is the best card. Now, if you have a deck where you have room to side in multiple hand traps and you're actually banking on winning with multiple, multiple hand traps, probably like 10 or 12 hand traps, then there's definitely an argument to bring in DD Crow because with other cards in tandem with DD Crow, it's always a good fight against this deck, right? If you have Nibiru plus DD Crow plus Ash, you're probably in a good spot. So having that extra utility, I think is really, really important. So if you're already siding this for the rest of the metagame, this is definitely a card you can bring in, provided you have enough space going second and you have cards going first to take out for it. Next is Nibiru the Primal Being. This card is quite good against this deck. Now, on its own, again, it's not enough. It's never enough because it can either threaten something like an Appaloosa with three monsters on the board plus a Link 2, or they can make a Baron de Fleur, or they can continue playing after you nib them, which is quite easy for the deck. But the thing is, Nibiru is a high-impact card on its own, 
when you combine it with other cards, right? So if you combine this with other cards like Didi Crow, Ash Blossom, Droll, then it gets really, really good. Because let's say we Droll them. Now we have the nib for the uh, little play that they're trying to follow up under Droll, right? They're investing all the resources onto the board. They can't search anything. We have the nib. This is really, really good. So I think against this deck, we have to side hand traps exclusively in large amounts to account for all their plays and uh, kind of cover all their angles because they have a lot of angles and it's scary. A back failure and impotent permanence. Now, this is a lot similar to Ash. I think you should definitely hit things that allow them to tap into the axis for their actual engine or any cards that allow them on their own to add two or more bodies or two or more cards to their rotation um, if it resolves. So what that means is I think Remheart, we should definitely try and stop this on the summon. Now, the one thing you have to watch out for is the fact that Remheart exists and his in hand ability is a quick effect that says you can target one Manadium monster or a 1500 attack 2100 defense monster you control pop it and special summon this so if you Valor or Imperm something like a Remheart you have the chance of actually getting blown out by a second copy or in the case of something like a right heart you have a chance of getting blown out which is why I don't suggest Imperming or Valoring on the right heart but I would definitely use it on the Remheart because number one they have less chance of opening two and number two this card is very very high impact in fact he's full combo on, him on himself so I think stopping this card is really really important you could potentially make an argument for waiting until the trisukta but that does actually put the meek into rotation which is scary if they have something like a calarium and they have something like a visa starfrost that means that they might not necessarily go into the trisukta line immediately instead they might just take advantage of the calarium plus the meek to put something like a baron de fleur on the table first and then by then it's kind of too late right so recognizing what cards we want to stop we don't really want to stop cards like fenrir that don't really do anything but we Probably want to stop cards that allow them to add, like Lightheart as well, allowing them to add a Scareclaw Rightheart, which special summons itself, draws a card potentially, and searches. That's multiple card advantage. So we cannot let them snowball. So any cards that allow them to actually snowball is really, really important to uh, keep track of and stop. Next is D-Shifter. There are not a lot of decks that can handle playing this card, but there are some that are siding it. Unfortunately, against this deck, although it may appear to be very, very powerful, it's not that powerful it's decently good don't get me wrong they don't get the graveyard they're not going to be able to use their extenders like scareclaw arrival they're not going to be able to go into vicious astroloud or cross sheep like uh shenanigans but they're still going to be able to play i mean read manadium meek this card can activate even in the banished zone it's kind of crazy so they can still put up some negates still put up a board now where dimension shifter actually comes in handy is when you pair it again with other hand traps if we have a shifter plus like a nib or a shifter with an imperm because you can't really be bailer under shifter but you know anything that lets you get the job done shifter will come in value here the other annoying thing about shifter is that it does clash with the draw and lockbird but you can get a little fancy if you side in both dimension shifter and draw you can actually wait until they add and then use the effect of shifter as chain link one and then chain link two draw because shifter has not yet resolved right so in that scenario you can use both and put them under the nightmare lock no graveyard no deck but i mean it does have that clash though so you have to be cognizant about that when you do draw both cards or if you're siding in both but it's good when you pair it with other hand traps Phantasma is one that doesn't immediately come to mind for a lot of players, but this does work very, very well when they do go into the link plays, namely Scareclaw Lightheart. So we're able to draw two cards, shuffle back one, meaning we're able to draw multiple non-engines, hopefully hand traps, and then use that in tandem with the Phantasma, which is quite nice in addition to getting a body. But the thing with Phantasma is there are probably a lot of other hand traps that are better siding, but if you're already siding Phantasma, then I would definitely bring it in with the other hand traps because again, multiple hand traps is what you need to stop this combo deck from winning. So having Phantasma to dig for or multiple copies of hand traps and also having that body to put pressure is really really nice so i think this is definitely a card we can bring in considering all things considered as well lancia is one of those cards that some players are actually considering siding this format it's not terrible against this deck because you can stop things from coming out like the vicious astrolab but it doesn't do enough i mean you are stopping certain things like potentially the dispatter shenanigans later on in the turn or potentially the cyframe omega but remember that you're ditching a card and if you think about cards that you can ditch as a negative one for a hand trap cards like drone lockbird are obviously way better but if you're already siding in multiple hand traps and you have room to side in more and you're already playing lancia then hey this is not a horrible card to consider bringing in just for that sheer fact that you can maybe stop some of their angles right so this is just something to consider there 
Beast Steals are not that great against this deck either, but there are obviously targets that you can stop. You can use it on the Visa Starfrost so they can't go into Astrolabe. You can use it on the Rykard or potentially another target from the Arrival. And it does put a body on the board, namely Magnum up because you're able to replace the card so he's essentially free. I'm not sure Druid Swarm is very good because he's basically a DD Crow against their deck. So if you think about DD Crow, yeah, it's not that great. But when you pair it with other hand traps, again, I keep repeating this, but it's true. You know, if you pair it with more hand traps, then they do become good. And the fact that Magnumut is such an amazing card is definitely a good choice, I would think, if you have more side cards to bring in. Now that's about it for the hand traps, I think. But let's talk about board breakers. The thing with board breakers is they're not good against this deck. I'm sorry guys, but if they get to the point where they're putting up the full board and you drop a turn, it's probably too late by then. We definitely have to stop them, especially because the better players are now going for this in crazy Cypher and Omega rip to hand loop with multiple Omni Negates on the board. These board wipes just don't do enough. And especially because they have an in engine counter trap in the form of a native refrain ring, which is searched at the end of every combo that says you can negate a spell trap or monster effect while they control mo uh, synchro monsters. So that means none of our cards like Dr Dark Ruler are gonna resolve and it's gonna be a bad time, which is why I highly recommend hand traps against this deck in multiple copies. But that being said, Lightning Storm starting at the top, not very good for obvious reasons we just went over. Same with Evenly Matched, not very good. Not cards that you actually wanna bring in. Triple Tactics Talent, and potentially even Triple Tactics Rust. Now there is an argument to play some board wipes if you're already playing them in your main deck and you brought in the extent of the hand trap siding that you have against Manadium and we're keeping in some board wipes. In that case, I could see Thrust and Talon still having some usage if you pair them with hand traps. So let's say we have two hand traps and we stop our opponent and now we're in the grind game. Our opponent has like one Baron de Fleur or something or this pattern and this tactics is what we need to break that mini board that they set up under the hand traps. Then that's where it gets good but the noticeable difference between talents and thrust and the cards like evenly matched and lightning storm is those cards like evenly matched and lightning storm are pure board wipes that you were already siding in specifically to be side cards whereas thrust and talents might have already been in your main deck so they can just stay there for the purpose of that they're already being played right they're actually cards that have multiple utility against the rest of the format whereas board breaks were specifically siding them to actually draw them against manadium not very good same with Dark Ruler and Moral, we just talked about it, but this card is just not enough, especially now that the deck just derps and puts up the reframing. And same thing with Droplet, not a fan of this card, especially having you discard cards, you know, sending cards, investing your resources before starting off your plays. It's just not enough. So that's about all I had for how to beat Manadium. If you guys have any tips to beat this deck, let us know in the comments below because the deck has evolved quite a bit since Agop came out. I'm not even sure of all the lines, guys. I'm scared. I'm as scared as you guys are, but I will be putting in hand traps if I go to YCS because hand traps actually work against this deck, but board breakers do not work. So guys, if there's one takeaway you can take away from this video, don't side in board breakers against Manadium. That's about it. I'll see you all in the next video. Thanks for tuning in.